um, did it. And I just wanted for Anna Judy Cooper to be looking at us um, because I'm going to talk about her. The other part of my prologue is when I um, got here last night at about 1 o'clock in the morning, uh, I decided that I didn't like half of my talk. I became really unsettled. And because I can really stay up, I rewrote the second half. So my folder is a mess. Uh, luckily, I brought bits and pieces uh, from other folders. Uh, so this is kind of like a quilt. So you're going to have to bear with me because I hand wrote the second half. And um, I think I like this one better. But I don't know if this is a good idea to do that, but that's what I did. <laughs> so, I want to especially thank Professor Omika Labin, whom I'm just meeting, convener of the symposium and Africana Studies, with whom, with whom I have had, as Rache has indicated, a very long collegial relationship over many years and journeyed here from, for various activities. I want to also acknowledge my other family, the Mahanti family, who are sitting in the back, uh, Professor Satya Mahanti, who is in the English department, and his daughter Uma, and I think, um, I think Satya had a little bit to do with, they're always trying to find an excuse for me to, to be in Ithaca. Um, I also want to acknowledge my good friend Zila Eisenstein, whose work I've been reading forever, and, and, and who I have a close connection with, though I didn't know it at the time. Her parents taught at the Atlanta University Center many, many years ago. I want to acknowledge as well two of my Spelman sisters, Noliwe Brooks, interim chair, and of course, Rache, who in many ways have been one of my many surrogate daughters. I have entitled this talk, Black Girl Rebellious, Memories of Girlhood, which is a work in progress, during which I probe, analyze, the ways in which black feminist thinkers, writers, activists, across generations have written about the significance of girlhood from the vantage point of their adult selves. I'll be forever grateful to you, Anika, because I had not realized, prior to the conference, how long in the making this project has been. As founding co-editor of Sage, the scholarly journal on black women, we published a thematic issue on mothers and daughters which ended up as a book project entitled Double Stitch, Black Women Write About Mothers and Daughters. This was the first edited collection that focused on black mother-daughter relationships. And it was during that time that I imagined interviewing black women writers such as Tony K. Bambara about their relationships with their mother, mothers. When I approached Tony in Atlanta, she looked me straight in the eye and quickly said, no. <laughs> but Linda Perkins, Linda Perkins' subsequent biography shed some light on their relationship, as well as Tony's relationship with her daughter, Tom, who donated her mother's private papers to our Spelman archives, which the center manages. In part, I believe, because of our annual conference on Tony Cade's amazing life and legacy. During our March conference, we do this every year, during our March conference, we previewed excerpts from filmmaker Louis Masai's documentary on Tony and mentioned and welcomed not just now uh, Carmen, but also Zoe, her daughter. So two generations. And when that documentary comes out, it is going to be amazing. So while working on Double Stitch, I began to conceptualize a book project that would examine the memoirs and private archives 
of selected black women activists, women, especially feminists, in order to probe more deeply and under-theorized and under-researched topic with respect to black family life. I was interested in a broad range of questions, and I'll just mention a few. Number one, what is the portrait of black girlhood that emerges in selected memoirs or the personal papers of, highly select, of a highly selected group of black women over time? Number two, how did they describe their relationships with their mothers, grandmothers, or other mothers, which is a term that uh, the, one of the authors of Double Stitch used? What was the nature of their rebellious selves as girls or young women? And in what ways did their various resistances impact their own lives and the socio-political terrain in which they struggled? What motivated them to choose a life of resistance in their early lives? And what sustained them over time? And finally, what can we learn from their examples? And in what ways are their early lives useful to us as we theorize black girlhood in the present? Like I said, I have a mess of, of paper up here. At this juncture, juncture, I am reminded of a few quotes from one of the most provocative revelatory texts, Bell Hooks's Bone Black, Memoirs of Girlhood, which was published in 1991, in which she reminds us that not enough is known about the experience of black girls in our society, and there is no one story of black girlhood. She was thinking primarily about the U.S. context, but I think her claim is correct. When Bell Hooks penned her narrative, the field of black girlhood studies had not emerged, even though Joyce Ladner's Tomorrow's Tomorrow, which was published in 1995, was out there. A quick genealogy, and this would be very quick, would include, and I'm talking about the genealogy of black girl studies, would include, and this is not a, a, a linear uh, gen genealogy, it would include the emergence in 2016 of the History of Black Girlhood Network a loose collective of scholars researching the experience of black girls globally, which was catalyzed by three black women in the aftermath of a conference on the history of children and youth in England. Were you there, Nita? In March, the group hosted its first conference at the University of Virginia, and we can now name a growing cadre of young scholars, including, of course, Professor Bennett who are pioneers in the field as a result of groundbreaking monographs. And I just will mention a few of them, because there are too many to name all of them. And they're not named in any particular order. Lakeisha Michelle Simmons's Crescent City Girls, The Lives of Young Black Women in Segregated New Orleans, 2015. Ruth Nicole Brown's Black Girlhood Celebration Toward a Hip-Hop Feminist Pedagogy and her second book, Hear Our Truths, The Creative Potential of Black Girlhood, that's 2013. Monique Morris's, which has probably had a tremendous impact because of its uh, policy implications, push out the criminalization of black girls in schools. Uh, uh, Marsha Shatlane's South Side Girls Growing Up in the Great Migration. I have not included pioneer texts uh, surrounding the African diaspora though I have a long list of those. Conferences are proliferating, including the one I think, Onika, you did attend in April of 2016 at Columbia University, which got a tremendous amount of attention of Black Girls Movement. While I am a student, and I want to really emphasize that, while I, while I am a student uh, in this new field uh, within Black Women's History and Black Feminist Studies, not an expert, I want to begin and this was the half of the paper that I uh, haven't disrupted. I want to begin, because I wasn't sure who all was in the audience, I want to begin by providing what is a really chilling picture of the plight of black girls and young women in the contemporary United States. 
And then after I do this, I'm going to move to the upbeat part, uh, the rebellious part. So the first, the, the, the first of this was stunning to me, and it's really hard to believe. According to a study conducted by Black Women's Blueprint, a black feminist organ, a radical black feminist organization located in Brooklyn, New York, who organized the Words of Fire conference that will convene at the Women's Center at Spelman next weekend. 60%, 60% of black girls have experienced some form of sexual abuse before they are 18. A similar study was conducted by the Black Women's Health Imperative, formerly by the National Black Women's Health Project, uh, seven years ago, and they argued that the rate was actually 40%. In studies of black women's sexuality, conducted by psychologist Dr. Gail and Elizabeth Wyden, Half of the women that she uh, experienced, uh, half of them admitted that they, they were sexually abused and had never told anyone, nobody. We now know that African American women are raped at a higher rate than white women in the US and are less likely to report it. And the only group of women who experience sexual abuse more than us uh, are Native American women. I don't, I don't want to pause right here and, and, and read something from, from Audre Lorde's Zami, which I had actually missed uh, until a researcher came to, to the Spelman Archives. We have the Audre Lorde papers, uh, Lynette Cole donated the Audre Lorde papers, and, and we get hundreds of researchers, and the re researcher came there and said, I want to um, I, I, I want to look at her journals and, and um, see if there's more there about Audre Lorde's own um, rape as a 10-year-old girl in, 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 in New York. And so I just want to, um, it, it's, it's one paragraph. And I had really missed it, and I'm now really in, in, the, in the journals. And uh, where is Professor Pat? Uh, your work has really influenced uh, how I see things and think about things because one of the things you're going to hear in my narratives is almost all of these women that I'm going to talk, talk about were whipped badly by their parents. So let me just, um, I just want to read this two paragraphs. Four years before, she, she, she's talking about the fact that you know, she hasn't had her menstrual cycle and, and her mother uh, takes her to the doctor presumably to find out why, but probably to make sure she's not pregnant, uh, takes her to, to the doctor. And so this um, stimulates uh, this particular paragraph from, from Audrey. But four years before, she's, uh, she, she's 10. So she's talking about herself at age 14. But four years before, I had had to find out if I was going to become pregnant. Because a boy from school, much bigger than me, had invited me up to the roof on my way home from the library and then threatened to break my glasses if I didn't let him stick his thing between my legs. And at that time, I knew only that being pregnant had something to do with sex, and sex had something to do with that thin, pencil-like thing, and was in general nasty, and not to be talked about by nice people. And, and I was afraid my mother might find out and what would she do to me then? I was not supposed to be looking at the mailboxes in the hallway of that house anyway, even though Doris was a girl in my class at St. Mark's who lived in that house, and I was always so lonely in the summer, particularly that summer when I was 10. So after I got home, I washed myself up and lied about why I was late getting home from the library and got equipment for being late. That must have been a hard summer for my parents at the office too, because that was the summer that I got equipment for something or all, for something or almost every day between the 4th of July and Labor Day. When I wasn't getting whippings, I hid out at the library on 135th Street and forged notes from my mother to get books from the, from the closed shelves and read about sex and having babies and waiting to become pregnant. Uh, Audrey never, never sh shared with anybody 
uh, her rape at age 10. The second thing I want to mention in terms of reality, and, and this has come up a lot in this gathering, so I will be very uh, quick about this. And this is the issue of um, missing black girls. Um, so I'll just, I'll just mention a little bit of the stats and just sort of repeat of what everybody has been saying. Uh, we know about the ways in which uh, this culture um, freaks out almost uh, when uh, upper middle class white girls or women are missing. I mean, we see this on the news. In any case, a, a 2016 report of the National Conference of State Legislatures revealed that uh, 46% of runways and homeless youth are reporting. So what I'm doing is, is, is giving the counter story of, of uh, what you've heard, that these girls are not being snatched uh, you know, from a bush. So, th so this is what the stats indicate, that 46% of them uh, have been physically abused. 38% report having been emotionally abused. 17% report having been forced into unwanted sexual activity with a relative or member of their household. And I just say here that I'm very pleased that, the, that uh, Professor Patton uh, wrote a, a really compelling article about the missing of girls in Washington, D.C. So I don't need to repeat that. Third um, depressing reality, transgender women and young girls of color face a disproportionate risk of violence. 35% uh, of homicide victims in the LGBTQ community and HIV impacted communities in 2014 were transgender females of color. According to the National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs, and I want to just remember these three uh, transgender human beings who got some attention in the news in New Orleans. Uh, Sierra McElvin, China Gibson, and Jacarius Holland. And I don't think any of these murders have been solved yet. I, I, I remember them also because a good friend of mine, uh, Freddie Hill, who's become an amateur photographer in um, New Orleans, knew these women um, very well. As a result of the research of the African American Policy Forum, co-founded by Kimberly Crenshaw and Luke Harris, and I'm very close to this work uh, as a member of the, uh, of, the, of the board. We now know, and I could, we could spend a long, a really long time on this, but I just want to mention a few things. And I, and I also want to just mention, because this context gets left out, we now know that black girls receive more severe sentences when they enter the juvenile justice system. And rather than repeat all of this, uh, I want to just, uh, say that you should really look at the report that the African American Policy Forum uh, released and also pushed out uh, over police and, un and, over and under protect. The, the more complex uh, context of this is that the African American Policy Forum was the only black organization that took on Obama's, President Obama's uh, black male initiative. Uh, they, the African American Policy Forum and I'm not sure that people know this, is the group that challenged the endangered black male, black boy thesis uh, that President Obama uh, perpetrated. And basically uh, what they argued is that we, we cannot just privilege uh, the situation of black uh, men and boys. And I will just say that um, Kimberly and Luke traveled to the White House uh, and were treated very badly. Uh, I'm on, well, I will. Uh, <laughs> Reverend, Reverend Al Sharpton was the liaison between the uh, White House and the uh, organization. They were basically chastised like they were graduate students and basically said, you know, given all of the, of the complexity that the president's having out there, how dare you um, embarrass him? And uh, African American Policy Forum also tried to generate some resistance among very progressive uh, black folk, and we hit up against a stone wall. Nobody wanted to 
uh, challenge the uh, Black Male Initiative or, or Obama. So the Say Her Name, the Say Her Name, the Say Her Name project, which has been tied to Black Lives Matter, and the, and the history of the African American policy form has somehow fallen out of that. I want to say that that we need to put that back in its appropriate historical context. The reason that we talk about say her name uh, is because of the work of, of, of Kim Crenshaw, and unfortunately, uh, that's not out there. And at the last board meeting, which was two days ago, we're trying to, you know, make sure that uh, that work is 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 important. Now to my um, book project, um, and and one of the reasons I never got back to it was that these other book projects that you mentioned uh, captured my attention, and I wasn't able to 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 juggle. So I don't know how much time I have. So I'm I'm going to get through the well. No, no. So I'm going to I'm going to just uh, give you a little um, taste. Uh, of this uh, book project, and, 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 and what, I've, what I've done is for today, uh, singled out uh, four um, uh, situations. Um, one has to begin uh, in a project like this with Incidents in the Life of the Slave Girl, which was published in 1861. Uh, it is a story of Harriet Jacobs, who used the pseudonym Linda Brent she began writing her narrative after escaping to New York. It was, of course, edited by Marie Child. And unfortunately, black male scholars decided that this was an inauthentic narrative, including the likes of John Blasingame. So the, 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 the narrative was not uh, taken very seriously, or I, I don't want to uh, say the word demonized, but it was perceived to be one of those fake narratives that a white person did, and it was sort of shell. And so, uh, thanks to Jane Yellen, who spent an inordinate amount of research verifying or authenticating, we uh, now have this, we can reclaim this narrative. And I actually remember reading this uh, narrative uh, as a graduate student. Um, I would say it is, it is the earliest account that we have of black girlhood and, and adolescence during slavery. And I want to just give a, 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 a little bit about this extraordinary narrative, uh, not assuming that uh, everybody in the room knows it. Born a slave in Edenton, North Carolina in 1813, Linda was relatively happy as a young child uh, with her brother, parents, and grandmother, though her circumstances changed drastically after her mother died. And one of, one of the things that, um, that I noticed in, in these narratives is the huge impact of the death of parents. And in some cases, um, these black women became orphans. Or in the case of someone like Ida Wells Barnett, became an adult really quickly when both of her parents overnight uh, succumbed to yellow fever uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. And anyway, in any case, at, at age six, she is sent to live in the so-called big house with her mother's owner. After a few years, her caretaker dies and bequeaths Linda to a relative. Her new masters are cruel and neglectful. And Dr. Flint, I would say the quintessential evil master of the father, tries to force her to have sex with him. And it's very interesting, he never rapes her, which is probably one of the few narratives or situations, um, and I'll mention in a minute uh, why that's the case. Um, he, he starts making sexual advances to her when she reaches puberty, but she resists, which is amazing. She resists by, this is interesting, she, she decided, and, and, and this she's, she's between 11 and 13, she decides, she, she crafts this plan, uh, and she decides that what she will do is that she will enter into a relationship with another white male voluntarily, another white male, uh, in order to thin evil Flint off. Uh, and, and she's assuming or hoping that Flint will be so upset 
that he will stop his uh, sexual advances. And so she um, um, gets into a consensual, and I'm, and I'm using that like this, relationship with Mr. Sands, uh, has uh, two so-called illegitimate children by him, and, uh, but Mr. Flint continues his sexual advances. But he is still wanting to have her succumb to his seduction rather than uh, have her be raped, which is, which is interesting. Uh, fearing that her children, uh, Benny and Ellen, uh, <coughs> will be sold, by this time, uh, Flint has um, taken her out of the big house and, and made her become a field slave where supposedly uh, she'll have a worse life. Uh, she contemplates an escape for the three of them uh, while still working on Flint's advances, which, which happened over years. I mean, I, I, it's hard to even imagine uh, this. Uh, and, she, and she continues to refuse to submit to his abuse or abandon her family. That is, she could have probably managed to escape by herself, but she couldn't manage to do this with three people. She decided uh, that she, since she could not keep Flint from off of her, she decided to hide in the attic of her grandmother, Aunt Martha's, in, in Aunt Martha's cabin, where she stayed for seven long years. And we know, of course, the narrative of the diary and Frank, but we don't know the narrative of Linda Brent. Um, uh, Flint assumes that she has uh, gone north, uh, so he eventually sells her children to a slave trader, but the slave trader, he doesn't know this, is secretly uh, attached to Sands. Uh, over this seven year period, if you can imagine, she becomes physically debilitated uh, as a result of the confinement because she can't stand or sit. And the only joy that she has in life during this seven year uh, confinement is that she's able to look out a small, through a small peephole and see her children playing. Uh, I won't um, continue the rest of this narrative, it's, it's an amazing narrative, but, but what, the, what this underscores is, a, it, it is, is the absolute horror of her girlhood, but the absolute rebelliousness. And it's hard to uh, analyze uh, how uh, Linda Brent managed. Uh, my second um, subject for the project is Anna Judy Cooper. Uh, people know more about her. I'm going to uh, be more brief. Uh, born a slave in 1858 or 1859. Uh, her father is her mother, Hannah's uh, slave master, who never, never acknowledged her, even though she worked uh, as a domestic servant uh, in his household. Uh, by the way, she uh, managed to live to be 105. Uh, and, and her extraordinary resistances and in intellectual work are legendary. I just want to mention, uh, in the little time I have, two things uh, with respect to her rebellious self. Um, she, she manages to get to a normal school in Raleigh, North, North Carolina, and she begins normal school there. She's precocious. She, um, or says no to the ladies' course. She says, no, you're not going to put me in, 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 in the ladies' course because I want to take the same courses that the men are taking. And so she takes the classics curriculum and she learns math and the classics in four languages, three of which she uh, is able to speak fluently later. Uh, she becomes a teacher at that same school and eventually ends up uh, being one of the earliest black women to enroll at Oberlin College. They try to get her to take the ladies' course. She says no. And um, uh, so, so, so that early rebelliousness is, 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 is amazing. Um, my next person is Pauline Marty. Um, this, the, the, the story of Pauline Marty is so incredible until I won't be able to do it justice. But I, I want to just mention there's, a, there's a, biography, a recent biography out on Pauline Murray, and there's also another text by uh, Pat Bell Scott uh, that talks about the 20-something year relationship between Eleanor Roosevelt 
and um, Paul Emerge, which has an incredible uh, title, like the five grand meets, whatever the rest of it is. And <clears throat> there are a lot of things that I thought I knew about Pauli Murray um, that I didn't. So let me just, um, I want to just talk about two things. Um, I, I had read, as most of you did, Pauli Murray's uh, memoir, which leaves out most of her uh, many aspects of her personal life. So I just want to read two, two aspects, and I didn't have time to, to paraphrase it, so I'm just going to read it. Uh, so Polly Murray was born November 20, uh, November, November 20, 1910. Um, this was the year that the NAACP was founded, so she was born at a very politically uh, engaged time. When she was, I didn't know this, when she was three years old, her mother suffered a massive cerebral hemorrhage on the family staircase and died on the spot. Her father, left along with his grief and six children under the age of 10, sent her to live with a maternal aunt, Pauline Fitzgerald, after whom she was named. This is the uh, part that I didn't know. Three years later, ravaged by anxiety, poverty, and illness, Pauline's father was committed to the Crownsville State Hospital for the Negro Insane, and there were lots of these, where in 1922, a white guard taunted him with racist epithets, dragged him to the basement, and beat him to death with a baseball bat. Pauly, who then was only 12 years old, traveled alone to Baltimore for the funeral, where she acquired her second and final memory of her father. Lay open in an open casket, his skull split open like a melon, and sewed together loosely with jagged stitches. This is, she's 12 years old. The, the, the second aspect of the memoir that I want to talk about very, very briefly is, which uh, Polly never talked about uh, in her memoir, was her uh, believing that she was actually uh, a boy. Uh, what, what we would now we would now use the rubric of transgender to describe uh, a Polly Murray. As a small girl, uh, she preferred boy clothes. She preferred boy um, chores. Uh, she renamed herself Paul. And also, at a certain point, uh, called herself Dude. Uh, she experienced tremendous <laughs> mental health challenges as a result of the distance between her gender identity and her and the body that she felt she was trapped in. And in fact, she was so convinced that she was a boy that she had the um, doctors uh, examine her internally to see if there were some hidden male organs there. Uh, she also tried very, very hard to change her gender by uh, using male hormones, which did not work. And she was in and out of mental health um, hospitals uh, for most of her life. Despite that, the legacy of Pauli Murray in terms of her political, intellectual, and feminist theorizing is amazing. And when I think about what Pauli Murray was able to do, uh, given what I just described, including eventually becoming a professor at Brandeis, she was, she was poor for most of her life. And in fact, when she was a sophomore at Hunter College, uh, she suffered from malnutrition. Uh, lost 20 pounds and could barely uh, get to class. And then finally, at the end of her life, uh, she's 74, 73, she decides to become an ordained Episcopalian priest, left her uh, comfortable professor job, and uh, died a couple of years later. One of the things that I really remember, and I've got to find it, is that when Sage Scholar Journal was founded, we got the most incredible note from Pauli Murray. And to be honest with you, I'm not sure I knew who Pauli Murray uh, was at that time. Um, and then I want to talk about Claudette Coleman, one of the most important figures in the uh, civil rights movement, uh, probably someone that most folk have never heard of. Uh, but, uh, Richet will have heard of her because she's from Montgomery, Alabama. I heard of her because I taught at uh, Alabama State. In any case, uh, she was among, what's, how am I doing on time? You're great. 
Okay, uh, Claudette was among the five plaintiffs uh, included in the federal court case, federal bus court case filed by legendary civil rights attorney Fred Gray, uh, February 1st, 1956. Uh, the case is uh, uh, Browder versus Gale. At age, let's see how old was she? At age 16. At age 16, Claudette uh, sat down, um, was, was sitting in the, on, on the bus in Montgomery, not in the white section, but in the colored section. And when a white woman came uh, onto the bus, which was the protocol then, I can remember very clearly. Uh, the bus driver got up, I mean, came there, she was sitting with three, three friends and told her to get up and move to the move. Uh, her friends got up, she stayed in her seat and, and started shouting out her constitutional rights. She was a member of the NAACP Youth Council and was, was fierce. Um, that didn't deter him. Uh, he called the police and um, she is 16 years old, and she's arrested, thrown uh, into, j into jail. Now, the, there's an there's a interesting backstory here, which has to do with the ways in which race, gender, and class intersect. The Women of the, uh, Women's Political Council, this is nine months before Rosa Parks sits down. The Women's Political Council wanted to use the Claudette Coleman case uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a case to, to get the Montgomery bus boycott uh, going. And the mainstream, mostly black male civil rights establishment said, no way, no way are we are going to have Claudette Calvin, a teenager from the wrong side of the tracks, promiscuous, no way are we going to uh, have her be involved in our cases. They lied on her and said she was pregnant, but she was not. Uh, and she was constructed as uh, having misbehaved on the bus. In other words, not only did she not move, but she you know, opened, up her, opened up her mouth. And so she fell into the category of disruptive, loud, difficult black girls and women that is a stereotype that we have not been able to uh, shake. Now, during the, during the bus boycott, uh, she becomes uh, pregnant as a teen, uh, forced to drop out of school, which is what uh, girls had to do then, was accused of sleeping with a white guy because the child was very light-skinned. I don't know, you know, we, I don't know why we wouldn't be familiar with that. Uh, uh, and, uh, she is demonized so badly in the black community until she flees the South and uh, goes north and becomes a nurse's aide and, 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 and has a, a challenged life around. She never finished her education and has a challenged life. Uh, uh, Claudette also harbored, as you can imagine, not resentment, but some frustration that Rosa Parks became the legendary, iconic figure in the Montgomery bus boycott. Uh, there's a wonderful memoir, uh, Claudette Carbon, Twice Toward Justice, uh, which, is, which is her story that was gathered by uh, a Philip Harris that is really, really uh, compelling. Um, there's more about Claudette, but I don't want to forget that. Um, and, 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 and I want to end with uh, Bell Hooks, who more than anybody um, who's living has chronicled her experience with patriarchy within her own household as a young girl and illuminates an aspect of black girlhood that is compelling and riveting. I've had a very long, loving, and complex relationship with Bell Hooks for 30 or 40 years. And I have to call her tomorrow and tell her that I reread um, um, Reread Bald Black, and I can now understand uh, some of our complexity. But I want to, I want to read, and again, Professor Patton, I've been 
really influenced by what you have forced us to see. I want to I want to just read um, some passages from Understanding Patriarchy. This is not from Bob Black uh, because it's one of the few uh, narratives we have about black girlhood, which uh, unmasks. How do we treat each other within our own communities? And so I just want to read a little of this. When my older brother and I were born, with the years separating us in age, patriarchy determined how we would each be regarded by our parents. Both our parents believed in patriarchy. They had been taught patriarchal thinking through religion. At church, they had learned that God created man to rule the world and everything in it and that it was the work of women to help men perform these tasks, to obey and to always assume a subordinate role in relation to a powerful man. They were taught that God was male. These teachings were reinforced in every institution they encountered. As their daughter, I was taught that it was my role to serve, to be weak, to be free from the burden of thinking, to caretake and nurture others. My brother was taught that it was his role to be served, to provide, to be strong, to think, strategize, and plan. I was always more interested in challenging patriarch patriarchy than my brother was, because it was the system that was always leaving me out of things that I wanted to be a part of. In our family life of the 50s, marbles was a boy's game. My brother had inherited his marble, marbles from men in the family. He had a tin box to keep them in, all sizes and shapes, marvelously colored. They were, to my eye, the most beautiful objects. We played together with them, often with me aggressively clinging to the marbles. I liked best, refusing to share. When Dad was at work, our stay-at-home mom was quite content to see us playing marbles together. Yet Dad, looking at our play from a patriarchal perspective, was disturbed by what he saw. One evening, my brother was given permission by dad to bring out the tent of marbles. I announced my desire to play and was told by my brother that girls don't play with marbles, that it was a boy's game. This made no, no sense in my four or five year old mind and I insisted on my right to play by picking up marbles and shooting them. Dad intervened to tell me to stop. I did not listen. His voice grew loud and loud and suddenly he snatched me up, broke a board, from our screen door and began to beat me with it, telling me, you're just a little girl. When I tell you to do something, I mean for you to do it. He beat me and he beat me, wanting me to acknowledge that I understood what I had done. His rage, his violence captured everyone's attention. Our family sat spellbound, wrapped before the pornography, this pornography of patriarchal violence. I remember this traumatic event so well because it was a story told again and again within our family. No one cared that the constant retelling might trigger post-traumatic stress. The retelling was necessary to reinforce both the message and the remembered state of absolute powerlessness. The recollection of this brutal whipping of a little girl daughter by a big strong man served as more than just a reminder to me of my gender place. It was a reminder to everyone watching, remembering, to all my siblings, male and female, and to our grown woman mother, that our patriarchal father was a ruler in our household. So I want to end, I want to stop by saying, I don't really have an ending to this talk. I was not able to come up with an ending, but I do want to end with thinking about my own girlhood, which I have not really done. My mother, Ernestine Granado Guy, was probably the first feminist I ever knew. She left my father when I was in the eighth grade, moved back with her parents, never remarried, and raised her three daughters to be independent, self-reliant, and resourceful. When I was in the ninth grade, it's 1958. She petitioned the Memphis Public Schools to weigh their home economics requirement for all female students and demanded that I be allowed to take typing, which was, which was reserved for juniors and seniors. 
This act of feminist defiance on her part sent several clear messages to me early on. That learning to be a homemaker was relatively unimportant. That the skills of a typist would be more useful to me as a serious college-bound student. And that one could resist patriarchal authority, including white patriarchal authority, which was the norm in Memphis. Whenever I reflect upon my journey to feminism, I always invoke the memory of my mother, who died too soon at age 62 of breast cancer, before I got a chance to say to her how much she had influenced her first, sometimes contrary, always talking back door. In one of our last conversations during her final hospital stay, after I had shown her my recently published uh, book on Spelman College, the second book I co-edited, she told me how proud she was of my accomplishments and what a good daughter I had been. Though I had not followed the conventional route of motherhood and was soon to be divorced, preferring instead to produce books, she thought out loud. She said, oh, I finally get it. Preferring instead to produce books, I was finally forgiven by my mother on that hospital bed and granted permission to continue my intellectual passions. One of my most cherished articles is the one John Blake wrote for the Atlanta Journal Constitution in March of 1982 on the status of women's studies, which he entitled Independent Colon, Mom Was Professor's First Role Model, which began with this appropriate statement. Beverly got Sheptoff's mother didn't know what feminism was, but she embodied its principles. And finally, just a few random thoughts. Once I was a girl, super shy, sheltered, smart, solitary, sweet, serious, big legs, small breasts, unruly hair, Wish it was straight like my mother's, long like my sister's, self-effacing, modest, unaffectionate, bookworm, studious, very nearsighted, sometimes silly, oldest of three girls, one rambunctious, the other one quiet, fierce, brilliant mother, non-patriarchal father, wary of boys, preferred girls, would rather read than eat, except for strawberry milkshakes, dreaded those menstrual cycles, loved my adventurous, artistic dad, maybe more than my mom, then, not now, not now. Thank you. Well, I always um, love hearing Beverly uh, hold forth. And while you were reading from the Bell Hooks narrative, I was thinking of Alice Walker's. Um, and there's, 
and I couldn't help but, but make some comparisons because Alice certainly talks about the, the um, sexism in her family, particularly uh, uh, with her brother. But somehow, uh, with, with Belle, I hear, um, and I hadn't read that uh, myself before, but, but, but in hers, I hear her uh, analyzing and, and, and complaining about the, the patriarchal structure and system in her home. With Alice Walker, I get a kind of ascription of evil <laughs> to the, uh, the form that patriarchy took in her family. Ascription of evil, possibly even to her, to the males in her family. Um, do you sense that kind of qualitative difference there? Because I, I, I feel sorry when I read Alice Walker's account. Uh, when I hear Bell Hooks, I, you know, I, I, I empathize, and it, I don't know whether hers is more intellectual, while Walker's is more emotional, I don't know, but, but, but I just feel so sorry for Alice Walker when I, when I read her. Do you have any? You know, one of the things that I, that, that I would say, uh, and I think this was not, may not have been true for Alice, uh, Bell had loving, a very loving grandfather. And, and the, and the uh, chapter on him in Bottom Black will, will just, so she had very good. And, and I will say, and Zilla, you can chime in, um, uh, Belle continued to love her father. Uh, and I don't think that she thought he was evil. I think that she thought that he learned, I mean, this, this is what you see uh, there, that, that her parents learned a patriarchy, and we would say they learned uh, he learned uh, that you whip uh, children. Though in this case, which, which I think he's, she, he, he's not whipping her to to protect her from white supremacy. He's whipping her because she's violating gender norms. And so the other thing that I would just simply say is that Alice is not a, a theorist. I mean, Al Alice, Alice is not. Uh, doing systemic structural analysis, uh, and that's what you see. I think in the that's what that's what you that's what you see here. Um, so that that's but but no, I don't I don't think that the Bell thinks that her uh, father was uh, evil. Does anybody anybody else want to weigh in on that? And you know, uh, Alice actually came. Came to reconcile to reconcile her uh, attitude about the father, and, and 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 you see that in the way in which Mister in the color purple is 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 uh, re re reimagined. Yeah. Uh, my my comment and question is: uh, the first panel this morning focused on a uh, kind of physical violence. And uh, maybe an aspect of the question is Alice, although it was considered to be an accident with yes. her eye, right. she analyzed it as the consequence right. of the patriarchal uh, arrangement even among the children in terms right. of what they could play with. So um, uh, Ben didn't have that experience, so mm -hmm. maybe it could have contributed to make that uh, different uh, uh, assessment mm -hmm. of the implication. I don't know what you think. No, I agree. I, I, I agree. She, she, she called it a, a patriarchal womb. Yeah. And, 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 and she sort of, uh, it, it was an accident, but her, her point was that, that parents allowed boy children to play with guns without thinking about the potential consequences. I don't know, like I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about so many different things, but one is the reimagining of blackness um, for black girls and black girls, because like your experience and the experience that um, you, you charted, um, I think that many of us in this room, I know I have experienced some of the things 
um, rape, uh, uh, you know, sexual trauma, um, also uh, being hurt by black women in the academy, um, and that completely um, alienating you from the work that you come here to do, right? And so um, I guess like kind of my question or my, my me seeking some type of resolution with that, and maybe there is none, is how do we reimagine ourselves um, through the university, through our communities, through the work that we do, um, unapologetically, because even, you know, like, I'm sure some of us are in, what is it, Binder? Um, and I don't even feel that's a safe space because people that I work with are in there who have abused me, um, who have abandoned me, who have, you know, treated me worse than um, others. And so, you know, hearing this narrative or the narratives that you spoke forth, it was like truth. And I've never experienced attending a historical black college. I wish that I had. I've always been at PWIs. So I've always come to women's studies and Africana studies. I have a PhD in Africana studies. Um, seeking that, that type of like kinship and family and community. And it was, it was a very interesting experience um, that didn't really give me that sense of community as to why or how I came to the field. Um, so I don't know, I think it's a question somewhere in there, but I just, I feel so um, just fed through your talk because I've never experienced a professor in my 10 plus years in the academy that was able to give me what you gave me in this talk. So I thank you. I've had a very complex relationship with Spelman College. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, a very complex relationship. A, a very different relationship than if I had been at a, uh, at a majority white, but a very complex relationship. And I'm trying to work on this memoir and trying to capture some of that complexity. So uh, I, I know what you mean. I, I will say though, and you know, frequently when I say this to black women who worked in the, who've been in the white academy, um, I have, I have not been bruised or damaged uh, by my work in the academy as well. Frustrated, I mean, I can say a whole lot of things, but not bruised. I mean, no one has ever questioned my intellect. They, they question my politics. <laughs> they question my sexuality. A lot of gossip. A lot of petty stuff. But I don't have to deal with, where did you get your a PhD from? Indiana. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I will say uh, that I was snatched off the tenure track by the black male president when I found at the Women's Center and had to write him a nasty letter and threatened, though I didn't have three dollars, threatened to have a, a, a legal response. But that was, you know, that was about my radical feminist politics. So yeah, I I know maybe somebody else wants to wants to weigh in on, on that, but I I you know when I go around um, uh, talking to black women, I would say unequivocally I cannot imagine a better life than the life I've had uh, as a professor, and I cannot imagine a life without the kinds of students that I have had now for forty. 47 years at Spelman, and two years at Alabama State, almost 50 years. And I would say that, the, that, that those students, uh, Rache is, I mean, I, I, I cannot imagine uh, that anything could have been better than to try to politicize and nurture, and in my case, because at Spelman, 99% of the people who sit in my classes are African American, women of African descent from all, and I cannot imagine a life that would have been better than that. I, I can say briefly myself that uh, it was a unique blessing to be able to be educated at a place like Spelman, because I think that there is a kind of safety there, a kind of support. I mean, I literally, as you can see from even my remarks in my introduction, fell in love with so many of my professors and, and really 
deeply admired and appreciated everything that they gave and, you know, in, in um, some cases have maintained con continuing contact over the years and has continued to be taught. I think that it was the kind of experience that really um, sent me out into the world with a lot of advantages and it was very empowering. So I wasn't really um, even anticipating in some in, in a sense that I wouldn't find that elsewhere. And I think that was the big disappointment in making the transition into the quote unquote real world, as some people put it, because, you know, it's, it's the kind of situation where you, you see that, say, not every black woman is your sister, or not every black woman is necessarily as invested in mentoring, or will necessarily, um, support or advance your interests and I think you know those are sobering lessons that a lot of people have critically engaged you know thank thank goodness um, the product of presumed incompetent in more recent years I think has been a valuable resource in terms of helping many people to grapple with the contradictions that um, black women and other women of color scholars can face when they enter institutions um, initially as graduate students and then eventually as professors because the, the challenges can be very real and you know for some never really disappear and so increasingly I think we need to think about strategies that can help us and sustain us and so uh, presumed incompetent is just that monumental book that provides a, a very useful resource they also have a site on Facebook that they're continually updating um, another resource that I highly recommend is uh, Deborah Gray White's book, Telling History, cover to cover. It's just a beautiful and brilliant read. I only wish there were a, a, an analog in literary studies where we're hearing brilliant and uh, distinguished historians talk about their experiences in pro the profession uh, from a personal standpoint, we know we've read their books, but to hear their stories, I think, makes such a difference. And so, I think that you know, in sharing your story, you really contributed in a powerful way, and that's one strategy for healing too. I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about fear. Um, how, how to get free from fear. Uh, that fear is often uh, implanted in us as children, often by our mothers, uh, fearing black males, fearing the police, um, you know, and it, it's infused in how we're socialized and how we speak and so on and so forth. And, and I don't know if you've seen some sort of generational shift in uh, younger black women scholars and how they speak in public spaces, particularly on social media. Like, I'm irreverent, I curse all the time, you know, I, you know, snatch wigs, all that kind of stuff. And sometimes I have my older uh, black women scholars who've lectured me about my um, behavior uh, in social media spaces. But I'm absolutely fearless mm -hmm. because I feel like, you know what? Black women are always wrong, so I might as well just take advantage of it and do wrong anyway. Um, so, but I, I, with all the changes in the academy, the corporatization of higher ed, fewer people getting tenure, uh, you know, the uh, conservative forces sort of colonizing higher ed, it, it's going to have real implications for the kind of scholarship we do, for our activism, and so on and so forth. So, I, I wonder if you can, hmm. you can address fear, um, you know, sort of linking it from our girlhood experiences to the kind of women we become and how we speak and conduct ourselves in and outside of the academy. So let me, let me, let me just, just, just say, being of a generation who was not in the public sphere because of the internet, I, I, cannot, I cannot imagine um, what it would have been like if I were, were the age of young people with social media and experiencing the cyber bullying and terrorism. I'm, I'm going to just give you one, exa one example. 
our amazing women's studies feminist students who organized uh, a mobilization against um, misogynist hip hop uh, a few years ago began to experience from our students at Spelman and students at Morehouse a huge internet attack. They were, their names were called out. Uh, they were called lesbians. Uh, 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 our students, some of our students went online and told, said, guys in Morehouse, come over here and beat their asses. And this is who they are, and, 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 and uh, here's where you can find I, I can I, I have no capacity to understand that and these these are some and some of those students I know. And number two, those I, those students were petri those students were petrified. And I didn't have much. I, I I didn't know. I had very little that I. I mean, what I said I'm sure was kind of useless. Uh, I mean, I talked about how I dealt, but I had a, I never had any public stuff like that. I, I'm just going to mention. Uh, in class Wednesday night, I decided to talk about your book. And I experienced a huge amount of, of uh, anger and rage on the part of uh, some students in my class. I mean, you know, whipping is fine, blah, 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 blah. And then one of the students really pounced on one of them. And, uh, no, no, pounced on two of them. And we talked after class. She was, you know, she, she asked me, you know, what did you think? I said, you know, you did what you should have done. When she, when she and her friend left my office, three of those women were downstairs of uh, uh, threatening to beat her ass. Uh, I mean, I mean, it was just, I mean, it was just really unbelievable. She came back upstairs. She came came back upstairs. She was. I mean, she could not, you know, she just could not believe she was frightened, she was, you know, so I, I did the best I could, but I'm, I, you know, what can, what, what can you say other than, you know, stay here a while, do you want me to call security, uh, do we think they're gone, we look out the window, we look out of the window, I mean, we were like, too, you know, it was just unbelievable. And uh, she finally calmed down and she went home and she texted me right before I came to the conference and said that she had shared this with the administrative assistant in the Women's Center and had been uh, advised to report uh, re re report this to the college uh, because she's, you know, she's not even, she, you know, she's, she's and, and, and this is a very secure, very tough, uh, undocumented, one of the few undocumented students that we've ever had a spell from uh, Bahamas. I mean, she is tough and she is fierce. And she says, the things that I have been through in life, but that just uh, did something to her. So I don't, I don't know that I have good answers for what it's like to be a young person navigating what I think is mean girl culture. Uh, and the kind of cyber, uh, cyber visibility and cyber bullying and just meanness that I just didn't experience as a, as a college student. You know, it was just no way. I mean, you know, people would talk about you behind your back, but you weren't gonna have any uh, postings. So I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I sometimes am very empathetic with what you experience uh, on Facebook. Uh, and I would just be, be really candid and honest with you. With you, there's certain things that I just don't put in the public. Uh, uh, not, not. Uh, I'm not talking about. I'm, I'm just saying I don't share everything I think about uh, things. I mean, I was very careful. Uh, you may remember this, Rache. I was very careful on the panel about Mich uh, Michelle Wallace. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, 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 what's her name? Uh, Michelle Obama. I censored my, myself, and I was glad I did. You know, because you, I mean, that's what happened to Bell Hooks, and she and I had a long conversation. You know, she was on the panel, she got a question, and she ended up uh, uh, talking about terrorism. It was, take, it was, it was, well, you know what happened. And uh, 
So I, I don't, sometimes I don't like live streaming in Q&A because you, you, you just, you know, it's, it's, it leaves you very vulnerable. So I don't know if that was an answer, but I'm, I mean, I, there, there's no way, for example, that I would, uh, when, when I was doing my underground work trying to make sure that a particular president in Spelman was, had a short tenure, uh, and also when Paula Giddings and I were doing our underground work, trying to make sure that Janetta Cole would be the first African-American president, we, this was stealth work. This was underground stealth plotting. Because we knew if our little cells came up on the surface, you know, so, so I, I think there are various strategies that one, one uses, and stealth is one of them. So I just don't, I don't uh, uh, show all my cards uh, because it's dangerous. I don't know if that's helpful. And let me just, just say, because I really do need to say this, that's not respectability politics, okay? That's strategic revolution. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. We, uh, let's be really, really, really clear that a lot of what old girls like me do, uh, we learn from our mothers, which is there are certain things that you don't uh, uh, reveal. So, yeah. Are there any further questions? Well, thank you so much.